And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to welcome you today for this very special Mystery Monday, because today I have debut mystery author Hagini Nagendra live from Bangalore, here to tell us about her brand new red hot book, The Bangalore Detectives Club. Harini, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Movements. Tell us about this gorgeous book. Thank you, Sarah. This is such fun to be here because I've listened to so many of the interviews you do and I'm really excited to be here. So, Yay! Yes. So, <laughs> so The Bangalore Detectives Club is a book that is that took 14 years to get from, from, from the, the beginning when Kaveri, my main hero, and dropped into my head um, in 2007. So it's, it's a book set in 1920s colonial Bangalore and the British are in Bangalore and uh, Bangalore is an, or is an interesting city in colonial times because it has the Maharaja of Mysore, the King of Mysore ruling one part of the city and the British ruling the other part of the city. And yeah. then you have, uh, you know, this, this young woman who's just married 19 year old Kaveri into a traditional family, but she loves maths, she loves swimming, she loves driving a car and she's very independent and has a mind of her own. And her husband, Ramu, is um, a little bemused by her. It's an arranged marriage. So through the book, they get to discover each other. Kaveri stumbles upon a mystery, of course, decides to solve it. And the rest is, is the book. The rest is the book and the book is good. So this book has gotten a rave review in the New York Times. Congratulations. This is so deserved and so earned and so many other rave reviews, including a starred review in Booklist, which we're going to talk about, and a starred review in Publishers Weekly, which we're also going to talk about. Rise Bowen, um, Abir Mukherjee, um, the M.W. Craven, uh, Katrina McPherson, so many people weighing in with their amazing words of praise and we're going to get into every delicious detail but first i just want to welcome everybody so we are streaming live to six different destinations on youtube and facebook so no matter where you're watching from welcome mystery family and friends um you're in the right place this is the right time and you know how it works this is your chance to ask this incredible author who has lived in both san diego and indiana as well as bangalore <laughs> anything you want about her book her writing her uh her 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 her, her lovely and beloved character um Kaveri. and we have so much to talk about so get the questions going in the comments leslie welcome to the conversation joining us live from canada giving us her signature canadian hello so currently we have three countries in the house india um america and canada if you're let us know where you're watching from everybody um, and uh, and let us know what questions you have for Harini. So first, Harini, I just have to share this incredible review that you got from the New York Times because I want to talk about this. So Sarah Weinman um, in the New York Times book review raved the first in an effervescent, I love that word, new mystery series by the ecology professor Harini Nagendra. The Bangalore Detectives Club turns back the clock a century. This is a treat for historical mystery lovers looking for a new series to savor or devour. Congratulations on that rave review. This is so earned. Um, oh my goodness, we have Tracy Clark in the house joining us from Chicago, award-winning, amazing author. Tracy <laughs> Clark, who's been on the show two or three times. She's coming back in December for her new book. I can't wait. I love Tracy. Tracy, welcome. She's saying, go Harini. Um, oh, Debbie's here. Hi, Debbie. Hi from Arizona. Welcome to the conversation, Debbie. Thanks so much for tuning in. Debbie just won a book from last week's giveaway. Um, and stay tuned, everybody, because we're doing another giveaway today. Um, okay, so back to this review. So Harini, um, as both a histor historical mystery lover um, and just a historical and separately mystery lover, I am loving this book. Um, tell us what you th you think. So you said it took you, did you say it took you 14 years to write this book? Tell years, us about yes. that journey. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us. I, I, fiction writing was my first love. So I used to do a lot of it when I was, a, when I was young, a child writing at home, writing for short story competitions. Then I wrote a few children's short stories that were published in newspapers later and um, a couple of um, did a, a writing course when I was in Bloomington, Indiana and did a, they had a couple of short stories. But then I left all of that and moved to academic writing. And, you know, it's a very different voice. I also write that uh, 
uh, in newspaper uh, columns and I write popular pieces and blogs, etc. And that brain is a very different brain because it's concise. You're always writing to word count. You're finishing 600 words or, you know, someone's going, if you do 610 words, someone's going to cut the wrong 10 words out of your column, right? So when I was doing research for my book in 2007, from I was writing, uh, starting work on Bangalore then, and it was not, it was not the, this book, but it was a nonfiction book called Nature in the City, looking at the ecological history of, the, of Bangalore. I had so much material. So I don't know if it was that, the material that I was looking at, or that um, I was pregnant. So my daughter was going to be born then. And I didn't know if it was a girl or boy, but we wanted a girl. And uh, so... And I was listening to my mother tell stories about the strong women in her family, her grandmother, and all of these interesting things. So maybe it was all of this. I don't know. But I do know that I was at my mom's place one afternoon and Kaveri landed in my head and almost demanded that I should write a book about her. So she was there and she was this live character, right? And at that time in my head, she wasn't yet married, but she was going to be married soon. So that changed a little bit along the way. But I didn't know how to write a murder mystery. I've read, I've read them all my life, almost, but uh, I didn't know how to write it. So I think I started with three different plots. I went sort of three-fourth way. I came back. It wasn't working. I started again, came back. It wasn't working, started again. And then eventually got the book three-fourth way uh, to the current plot and uh, met my agent. So my agent is also an old school friend, Priya Raswami, who's also from Bangalore. And so she was completely, you know, very inspired and very inspiring and said, just, you should finish this. And I said, you know, I need a deadline. Give me a deadline. I'm an academic. I work to deadlines. So Priya gave me a deadline. I did the book and then we workshopped it a couple of times back and forth. And then it, that's the rest of the journey. Now, Harini, you said when in your journalistic writing, you, you know, if they want 600 words and you give them 610, those 10 words are going to get cut. Um, did that kind of uh, really tight writing help you to write this book um, or was or did or did you have the room to flow or did it is it two totally different mindsets? How did that work? So I think what helps is a few things. Uh, one is that I can turn up every day and write and I can make time to write and I can multitask. So I don't have the, the problem. I haven't had the problem yet. Famous last word, you know, knock on wood. Uh, I, that I, that I, exactly knock on wood that I, that I turn up to, to write and I haven't got anything to write. So that's not been a problem. Uh, I'm also, I have a fairly thick skin. I mean, academics get peer reviews all the time. We get, you know, some very lovely ones. We get some very nasty ones. So I'm, I want good feedback and I'm very happy to take feedback and I don't care about the tone in which people give me feedback. So, but what it is, is I really have to turn the, the academic writing side of my brain off because otherwise I'm constantly writing to word count or second guessing myself and say, why, why do you have to write this long sentence? Can't you write it short? And that interferes with the whole creative process of writing fiction. So one thing I have realized is that when I'm writing my fiction books, and I did this with my second book, uh, which just went in. So when I when I do my fiction books, I have to, uh, I can't do them after writing nonfiction. I can do it the other way around. So I either do this first thing in the morning or do it on a day when I have meetings and things, but I don't have any writing, academic writing to do mm. or journalist writing to do. I love that. Uh, Donna, welcome to the conversation. First of all, I love your profile picture holding up the tower, the leaning tower of Pisa there. I, I went there on my honeymoon and, and did one of those shots. I'm not ashamed to admit it. So, so great to see that. Donna would like to know, did you use how to write a mystery book to help with the formula? Great question, Donna. Harini, give us a skinny. Great question. No, I mean, I. so what I did was after I think I wrote the one of the semi-final drafts, I read a whole bunch of how to write mystery books and about the three arc you know, storyline, the five, the five act, three act, seven act, or writing from the middle and working outwards. None of them helped me, I have to say, because I couldn't wrap my head around that. My book, I've realized, or my writing style so far is very character driven. I know the characters, I want to put them in a setting and see what they do. And then what they do leads to something else and leads to something else. And then the mystery evolves. And so I, I just, I tried writing the plot. A, I can't do it. I can't sit and think of a plot in isolation from characters. Something has to happen for the next thing to happen. And the second thing is the couple of times I tried doing that, not with this book, but another book that I was also writing, uh, you know, completely different uh, set in more contemporary times. 
I was trying that out just to see how it worked for me as a writer. And I realized that if I had a plot and I had a plot neatly written out, uh, this was for NaNoWriMo. And I was bored because I knew what was going to happen. So I was bored as I was writing. It didn't seem fun. I stopped it. You know, so. So you did participate in NaNoWriMo. So for those who don't know, that is National Novel Writing Month, where writers try to write a book or as much of it as they can in the 30 days of November. And then you you hashtag it on Twitter. You let everyone know how your progress is going. So how much of that was written in NaNoWriMo? Not this book. So there's another book, book I was trying. Okay. No, not this book at all. I was trying out another contemporary mystery and I did 45,000 words. And I'm not, this is two years ago. Okay. So this is one of the lockdowns and I was just bored. So I tried it. I have no idea what's going. It's, it's still, it's sort of tucked away somewhere. I'll probably come back to it at some point. Exactly. Okay, cool. Um, Priya, welcome to the conversation. So nice to have you. She says, woohoo, Harini is a dream author. I love her to pieces. Yay, Priya, welcome. Thank you so much for those kind words um, for joining us here today. Harini, is, I totally agree, is a dream author. Um, Harini. And Priya is my fabulous agent, by the way. The oh, hi, Priya. Yay. Welcome to the conversation. It's so great to put a name with the uh, face right, with the right. name in terms of and now I'm picturing you two workshopping it as Harini said. Um, Donna is laughing about her p holding up the tower of Pisa profile. <laughs> We've all been there. Right? If you go to Italy, you got to do that. Yes. Um, Priya is saying hi. Priya, tell us what you loved about this book. Um, what resonated with you from the very first? And while you're uh, thinking that over, I want to share another rave review. This one, a starred review from Booklist. Congratulations. Booklist raving set in colonial India in 1921. This debut mystery, the first in a projected series, makes full use of the oppressive British rule of the time, matched by the oppressive treatment of, win of women to highlight the ingenuity and bravery of a young woman determined to solve a, mur a murder. Nagendra's uh, evocation of setting is riveting and her use of colonial history is thoroughly fascinating, with devastating depictions of the airy condescension of the British. A fine promise, uh, a fine start to a promising series. So, Harini, let's start there. Um, there I want to talk about each part of that. So, first of all, the um, the oppressive treatment of of women. What was your research process like? So there's one scene where she is going to go swimming in public, um, where Kaviri is going to go swimming, and and usually she's wearing a sari, which is eight yards of fabric. But if you're trying to swim with eight yards of fabric, that's pretty heavy. So she has she ties it off under her petticoats, um, so she's not being sunk. <laughs> Um, so, so she's in Bangalore, she gets to go swimming, not just in the, you know, private well where her, in her family's compound, but you know, her like out there in public. Um, so that's a moment of, you know, more rural, you know, sort of conservative living, conservative family. Yes. Tell us, tell us about all of this. So one of the things I did want to put in, Kaveri was a strong woman from the moment she landed in my head. But the times were not a times that were kind for women, right? And this again, talking about, so a lot of my research was, um, or uh, let's say inspiration came from stories in my family. So my husband's aunt, who's now 96, uh, where used to go swimming in a sari in the 1930s in um, uh, Madras. Uh, yeah, and uh, another friend's grandmother, whom I was interviewing for something else, also went swimming in a sari in Bangalore. So she, there was this, you know, this, um, these were really, these were real stories. But on the other hand, there were so many things that a woman couldn't do. I'm thinking of my mother, my mother-in-law, strong women who fought against their families, who wanted to stay, keep them at home. And they went to hostels and studied and did undergraduate degrees, which was, you know, in those days, in the 1960s, very something that many women did not do. But then eventually they wanted to study further and they couldn't because they got married. And then they wanted to work when they couldn't because they had children and everything had to fit around husband's career and things like that. So Kaveri, if you think of her in 1920s, there were so many societal restrictions on what women could and couldn't do. And in some ways, uh, you know, though the caste structure and the class structure was very hierarchical, and of course, the British versus Indian, it, but in some ways, Indian women from good families, quote unquote, so, you know, uh, upper class, wealthy families, were actually much more monitored because there were so many things that a woman from a good family couldn't do. A good wife, a good mother, not supposed to step out and do things on her own, not step, supposed to step out in public. So I did want to highlight that. For instance, there's a, a part where Kaveri goes to where, the place where the cowherds are. 
and women in the roads like hers from the big bungalows are all at home cooking for their men once they're gone but these women are out in the streets because they have to take their cows to graze they have to cut the firewood everything is out on the streets and so in some senses even though they have a harder life they have a freer life in some aspects oh that's really interesting um and i've noticed that in other um pieces of of my own research as well that 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 it, that class and privilege doesn't always act equal access and liberation yes. or freedom, which yes. is kind of an interesting and mind boggling twist. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that. So thank you for, 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 you know, illustrating for that for us and letting us know how it would, how it would um, play out. Donna is saying, I laughed about her being bored with the story that was already plotted. I never thought about that. Shows a sign of a very active mind. Yeah. Harini, thank you for that inside peek um, into your, into your process. That's really cool to know. Um, and speaking of which, you have another book in the works. And I always ask everyone to reveal at least one secret. So Harini, tell us your secret. I'd love to. So yes, I do have the second in the series, which has, a, I can tell you the title, and then you could wait for the rest. It's called Murder Under the Red Moon. So oh, Kaveri murder. realizes, yes, Murder Under the Red Moon. So Kaveri realizes that Bangalore is not as um, quiet a place that she thought it would be. And she's wondering why she agreed to get married and move there, because she seems to be stumbling on murders. And when is it out, Harini? Uh, next May, this around this time. <gasps> Murder under the red moon. Now, um, tell us about your titles. Do you people always want to know about the title? Did did you get to pick the title? Did it always was it always with you? Did it come at the last minute? Did you work with your agent or editor to come up with it? Tell us about the about both titles, but first the Bangalore Detectives Club. Oh, the Bangalore. Det so we workshopped all kinds of titles. So Priya and I went back and forth and. Well, once the book was taken by Little Brown, they went back and forth with us and we came up with a hold up. There was one night I remember because we're doing US, UK, India. So all three time zones because uh, Little Brown UK is the one that took the world rights and then sold it to the US. So it's publishers in the UK, Priya in the US, my, me in India. And we're all doing this email exchange of titles, 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 titles. But then the editors in the UK came up with the idea of the Bangalore Detectives Club. And we all, as soon as they did, we knew we loved it and it was perfect. It is perfect. And it also has the most gorgeous cover. So red and orange are my two favorite colors. So this works well for Mine me. Too. Mine too. Yay! Sunset colors. And it just is so beautiful and so vibrant. And there she is in her beautiful sari. And it, you just, it immediately immerses you in this vibrant, gorgeous, historically enriching culture. Um, so um Ooh, okay. Questions are pouring in. I want to get to these. Donna is saying, I'm completely fascinated by the history, the society, and its rules, and this author. Thank you for having Ms. Nagendra. I'm so looking forward to reading this. Yay, Donna. I totally agree. So I'm a fan of all those things, right? The history, the society, the rules, the research, because we know we have an academic in the house. Um, so it's so great to know that this was so carefully researched, so, you know, fact-checked and, and made sure everything was in order so we can trust that all this information is correct. Um, uh, you are going to love to love it. And I want to let everyone know the book is out now. So you can grab your copy today from our favorite woman-owned bookstore. And that is Murder by the Book. So I'm going to pop the yeah. link in the um in the in the in the comments right here and you can grab your copy today and the good folks at murder by the book will um will send it out tomorrow so here it is grab your copy um oh okay priya is saying there is so much that she loved about this book i'm going to pop this up very quickly harini and i talked so much about our feisty and brilliant grandmothers who were restricted by society but also taught themselves to read and write english and other indian languages for instance my grandmother studied the newspaper every day and did crosswords on a daily basis my grandmother also played tennis in her saris and was a champion bridge player and later teamed up with my grandfather to win a lot of competitions how fascinating so harini did your, your grandmother taught herself to read and write English. How, what an incredible accomplishment. So my mother's grandmother, actually. So my mother's grandfather, my, yeah, for Priya, it was Priya's grandma. But my mother's grandmother, um, her husband was um, worked in the British jail. So he was an Indian working with the British. And so she taught herself how to read and write in English. 
and uh, she was a herbal doctor because she'd been trained by her father who was a herbal doctor so she was also she acted like a midwife so you know again th- talking about cutting across uh, class barriers uh, she used to tell my mother how uh, when they were in uti which is where my grandfather was uh, in the jail working in the jail they would get a knock on the door at night and there would be a strange man with a cart somewhere and uh, yeah my grandmother would just go with him to his house because his wife needed to deliver a baby she oh. deliver the baby then dig a pit in the garden bury the after birth and then come back and then do her mothering duties wife duties wow. you know all of the rest of the stuff so but wow. she could go in the middle of the night with a strange man because delivering a child was god's work mm so she was safe to leave her house in the middle of the night to go off with oh. a man who nobody yeah. knew nobody <laughs> knew but her and her husband would her husband who otherwise had expectations of her would be fine with her doing this because Yeah. Wow. This was your great grandmother. This was my great grandmother whom How? I never knew but but through my mother's stories you know this lives on. And this would be like 1890s to 1905 that that period. Wow. So 1890s in Uti. Yes. Right area? Yes. Okay. Okay. Wow. Oh my gosh. Um this is this is just so I mean hearing about this midwifery um from the 1890s. This is a, Wow, like a first-hand glimpse into history. Thank you. Um Harini, you have also gotten a, a starred review. You have earned a starred review from Publishers Weekly as well, PW raving about the book, saying Nagendra makes her fiction debut with an exceptional series launch by pre- by placing her intelligent and clear-eyed protagonist in the multi-layered and multi- multicultural milieu mil- Malu of colonial India, Nagendra, a university professor in Bangalore, imbues this mystery with a rich, edifying and authentic feel. Readers will help Kaviri and Ramu will be back very soon. Congratulations on that amazing praise. Um let's talk about the multi-layered and multicultural Malu. And I'm hoping saying I think I I should be I hope I'm saying that word right. <laughs> Now I'm panicked that I'm not. Um how do you weave a because it's complicated to tell complicated stories um especially multicultural stories so how did you layer it on to to provide as they said this edifying um rich and authentic feel without batting the reader over the head yeah. or lecturing to them how do you think you did that like what's the secret so i i had, I had to work on it and I, yeah. i have to say it was much easier for book 2 than it was for book 1 and um, one of the thing i really did want to show how bangalore because it was such an unusual city with the maharaja having control over one part of the city and the british having control over another part of the city and there were gates and posts through which people could pass and sometimes the you know in in the ecology research for instance there was a lake that someone wanted to convert to the british wanted a lake to be drained to play polo and this is we're talking 1890s and the and the maharaja um there were a number of orchard owners and garden owners who said you have to leave the lake there because it gives us water which will be used yeah. for our gardens right of course and so the maharaja spoke on behalf of them because they were his tax payers and there was this little bit of a confrontation but it ended with the british playing polo on the lake being drained so there's a lot of that which comes up with my ecology and i obviously can't dump all of this information on the reader but i can maybe show it in other ways so the you know one of the ways i showed it in was the british uh, inability to pronounce indian names so they always change names and you know for a place it was okay but i show this british woman also having her house help and staff and she can't pronounce their names so she just calls them a christian name which was common also so i i remember uh, having uh, yeah knowing knowing some people who were either anglo indian or british and uh, at that time it was there was still remnants of that kind of a thing that i i can't pronounce these names i'm just going to call somebody something Mm. Mm. That's re- yeah, let's pause on that for a minute because names really matter. And yes. that is our identity, that is our self-expression, and that is our history, our ethnicity, our the, the our you know, our history stretching all the way back for the generations. Yes. So it matters to get someone's name right. And I always want to get everybody's name right because if you don't, you're stripping them of that sacred part mm-hmm. of their identity and there has been this harmful history of some of 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 white anglo people not wanting to put the work in to learn Absolutely. how to pronounce other names and 
projecting their own centering and projecting their yes. own whiteness and English speaking on, on cultures that are not, yes. um, which is sort of essentially dehumanizing. Um, so that I thought was a very painful, poignant, and powerful part of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, my friend, Dr. Samia Dave, who is um, a first-generation Indian American, um, she was in line for a book signing with Candace Bushnell, I believe, who wrote Sex in the City. Mm -hmm. And Samia noticed in herself that she had always sort of been uncomfortable to correct people when they didn't say her name right. And so she would allow to spare them the discomfort, she would just let yeah. them mispronounce it. And so when Candace Bushnell asked her how to sign her book, Samia tried to spare her the embarrassment. And Candace Bushnell looked at her and said, don't ever like try to spare people that embarrassment. Let them get your name right. That's and it changed that's, everything for Samia. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's such oh, that's a, a lovely story. story. Yeah. So getting names right. And so I loved those moments in your book because it it just brings you right into it. Um so thank yeah. you for that. Thanks. But but it was a, it was not easy, I think, because the, the whole editing process, I did tend to put great chunks of things. So what, what I had to do then is go back and take out all these chunks and make like three lines here and three lines there or find a, a narrative that would show this but not tell, you know, and it it's, I guess, something that you get, get hopefully gets better with practice. Yes, thank you. Um, Donna saying she just bought the audio version. She'll walk on the beach and transport herself into another amazing life. Yes, you can smell the 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 sense of the delicious food and the and the flowers and all of the you know you, it really immerses you in. Let's talk about the voice of the audiobook. Harini, did you get input into that? Are you happy with the voice? Tell us about that. I haven't yet heard the audio version, so oh, I need okay. to listen to that. But they were very, very particular speaking of names and accents and pronunciations. So they sent me a 300 word Excel file and they asked me to say each name out loud. So I recorded it in my phone and I sent it back to them. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So they, I know they took a huge amount of care and I'm really looking forward to listening to the book. Yay. Yay. I know this going to be so fun for you to hear somebody else reading your words yes. of your of your character of hearing Caverdi, like you know speaking yes. in this other person's voice that's really cool donna let us know what you think of the audiobook how fun um okay we have three minutes left so anyone have any questions get them going i'm going to share a few more amazing reviews um rise bowen new york times bestselling author says this is a classic whodunit with the added appeal of a female sleuth in colonial india for western readers a fascinating glimpse into customs and a mindset very different from our own. Um, I know that I love it, learning about that different mindset. Um, Harini, when you were writing this book, did you were you picturing it as mostly being you know ha mostly being read by Western readers and having to educate us and bring us into that world, or were you also picturing it more for an Indian reader? What well, who is your ideal? Reader? A mix, a mix, a mix. Because I, I have a lot of readers in India as well, so I did want to write uh, to explain a little bit about what I, I was doing with unfamiliar terms and, and but not to do so much that it would put off the reader from Bangalore, for instance. Right, exactly. And actually, at the at the end, you have you provide a list of, um, right. of uh, uh, that people can sort of, you know, called Caveri's dictionary so that if there's any confusion, you can just flip to that and also some recipes. Yes. Um, now, I love to cook. So I can't wait to be making this sweet corn and pomegranate custom body. Um, so how oh, did boy. you choose the recipes? Are these your favorites? Or? How'd you pick them? Mostly, mostly my favorites. And then Priya and I went back and forth on, on some of these. But yes, mostly my favorites. I wanted something fresh and delicious and, and healthy, but also something that brings out the flavor and, and is not something that you'd normally find in an Indian restaurant in the US or the UK. So that's that's what I really want. But I didn't want to give the really complicated recipes because <laughs> I like cooking, but I, I don't like ours in the kitchen. And I think most of us don't. So. <laughs> Exactly. You, you you provide a 32 page recipe. You're like, this should be ready in a, in a quick five to eight hours. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. These are quick and easy and delicious. Um, I, and I love the, what a fun idea to put these in. And also you, you had said that they were historically accurate. So this is something that Caveri, yeah. you know, could be eating in 19, yes. in 1921, Absolutely. which is even more fun. How did you know what they were eating in 1921? 
So again, through my mom and a lot of discussions with her about what people were cooking, my aunts, you know, what what they grew up eating, and it wasn't that different. Things changed in the 1960s okay. or thereabouts. So, in the 1960s, okay, great, yes, okay, yes. great. What's your favorite go-to midweek meal? Ah, just um, uh, rice and uh, something uh, like a sambar, a, a curry with lentils and uh, some vegetables. Oh, delicious, delicious. Okay, y'all, we are out of time, but I want to remind you to grab your copy of the book today. You're going to want to cook all of these recipes, eat all of these recipes. Um, they are so, so fun. So grab your copy today and then um, pop over to the Mystery and Thriller Mavens Facebook group and let us know what your favorite recipe is, what your favorite part of the book is. Um, we, we continue all the good conversation over there. So I'll put the link as well. Here it is free and open to all in Mystery and Thriller Mavens Facebook group. Um, Harini, it is 1130 at night there. So I want to thank you for staying up late to join us for, we should call this Mystery and Thriller Mavens late night because it is late night over there. Priya is saying, what a great session. Thank you so much. Priya, thanks for jumping on and being here with us. Thank you for letting us know what you loved about the book. It's so cool to to know from your um, agent's perspective what immediately resonated to hear how you two work together. Um, Harini, anything you wish I'd asked? Anything you want to tell us before we wrap for the day? No, this is just fun. I, and I hope I can do this with you again next year. Oh my gosh, we would love to have you back. So thank you for sharing the title of your brand new book out May 2023. Um, and I, when it is out, Murder Under the Red Moon, come back and give us the inside scoop on that. Let's put it on the Ooh, let's yes. put it on the calendar now. Harini <laughs> Nagantra will be back in May. Thanks for all the hearts up on Facebook, you guys. Um, we'll be back in May 2023 to give us the inside scoop on Murder Under the Red Moon. Um, you're not going to want to miss it. But meanwhile, grab the Bangalore Detectives today. A uh, link is right here in the comments. Harini, thank you so much for staying up late to join us. Thank you, Mystery and Thriller Mavens, for jumping on to talk with us and I will see you tonight at 7 and 8 p.m. with Dervla McTiernan and the amazing Victoria Helen Stone. Have a great day and hang in there because remember mystery Mondays because Mondays can be murder. Have a great day everybody. Thank you.